Next, we'll look at code that can be used to run regression trees. There are several packages available for running regression trees, and my favorite is the one called Party. But feel free to play with the others. There's one called rpart, for example, that a lot of people like. I've already installed the package, so I don't need to run this line, um, but every time you use a package, you need to run the library line. So I'll go ahead and do that, and now I have access to all the functions that are within the Party package. And what I want to do is I'm going to specify my tree. And the function within the party package for specifying my regression tree is called ctree. There's a couple ways to do it. One is to refer to the vectors themselves. In other words, the name of the data set, dollar sign, name of the variable. So what comes first when you specify which tree you want inside the ctree command is the outcome variable. So for example, perhaps I want to use the iris data set to predict sepal lengths. So my outcome variable is sepal length. I'm going to write iris dollar sign sepal length first, and that is my outcome variable. Then I write the tilde. And when I um, type the word tilde in R, I think the word by in my head. So I want to predict sepal length by some other variables. This tilde separates the outcome variable on the left from the predictor variables which are going to be on the right. And I can specify as many of these as I want. Um, so for example, I could write iris dollar sign sepal width, iris dollar sign petal length, and the various variables that I'm including as predictors are separated with plus signs. If I run this line of code, uh, the one labeled 95 in the uh, window that I have open, I'm going to run this function ctree to predict sepal length based on sepal width and petal length, and the output from this ctree function is going to be called tree output one. So I can go ahead and do that. Now before we actually look at that output, I want to point out that there's another way I could have specified this formula. Um, instead of typing iris dollar sign every time, I could have included an additional argument at the end, data equals iris, and then I can just refer directly to the variable names and that saves me some effort. That's often a better way to do things and in fact, um, as, as we start to do things like use predict functions to uh, predict uh, future values for the results of a, of a model, like a tree model or any other model, um, sometimes we actually have to have specified the model this way with data equals something and then only the variable names here or else it doesn't work. So I can run this line as well and actually tree output one is the same thing regardless of whether I run this line or this line. So now I can um, look at the results, and the best way to look at the output from C tree is to make a picture of the tree. If I say plot tree output one, that's going to happen automatically. Now there's too much in this picture, but we can see that it has indeed produced a tree. So looking at this for a moment here, uh, what this is telling us is that we're going to begin with the petal length variable if we're trying to make predictions. And if the petal length for the flower we're interested in is greater than 4.2, we'll go this way. And if it's less than or equal to 4.2, we'll go this way. Um, suppose that it's less than or equal to 4.2. Now we're over here, and now we're going to ask the question, OK, is the petal length less than or equal to 3.3 or greater than 3.3, etc., until we end up at one of these nodes um, on the bottom. And there's some information um, in here that is useful. So for example, you can't quite see it. Um, you can't see the closed parentheses everywhere because the window is not quite wide enough. There's too much information being shown here. But if we follow the tree and we got all the way, for example, down here, uh, we can see how many flowers in the training data set um, had these characteristics. So there are 13 flowers down here. And then we have a box plot showing the outcome variable, the sepal length, for those 13 flowers. And what we can see is these nodes at the bottom, these groupings of the flowers, um, do indeed produce um, box plots showing different values of the outcomes. In other words, these nine flowers have really different sepal lengths than these 11 flowers. So perhaps this tree does produce a useful um, separation between different flowers that we could use for predictions. I've also given you some code here that you can use to simplify the plot because there's just kind of too much in here. If you look at this, like why do we need the number one, two, three um, on the on the breakpoints? And these p-values, you know, maybe we don't actually need to see them. Um, so if I run this line, it takes off of those, the numbers on the nodes, um, the numbers um, on the breakpoints, and the p-values. This just looks much cleaner. In addition, if we don't actually want to see these box plots, um, if that wasn't our interest, um, if I run this line, it takes away the box plots and instead just tells me the mean. Um, so for example, 
um, for these 11 flowers down here that have petal length less than 4.2, in fact, petal length less than 3.3, uh, sepal width less than 3.2, and also really petal length is less than 1.4. For those 11 flowers, the mean sepal length was 4.618. So now I don't have the whole box plot, but looking across these nodes, you can still see this pattern um, that we are indeed separating the flowers such that within each grouping of flowers based on the predictors, the outcome variable has a different mean value. I want to pause and mention one other thing um, that's not actually explicitly in the code file. Suppose that you um, had a data set with a lot of predictors, um, a lot of different variables in it. So suppose the iris data set had lots and lots of predictors. And suppose that what you wanted to do was make a tree using all of them. Um, you actually don't have to type them all. If I said, for example, sepal.length goes like, so sepal length by, and then just a period, data equals iris, what this would do is it would create a tree predicting sepal length using all of the um, all of the other variables, all the variables in iris other than sepal length. And so if that was my interest here, I could do that. Um, in fact, why not do it? I'll make a little temporary tree that'll run, and I can make a plot of that temporary tree. Okay, and there it is. And so you can see petal length and sepal width. Um, are some of the predictors that were included here, which is not a surprise. There's a reason I chose those predictors for the original tree, but the point is that now that I've used this period, um, other elements of the data set, such as species, other variables in the data set, were also considered as possible predictors, and I saved myself the time of, of writing down all of the variables. And I'll show you what happens when the outcome variable is categorical because that works fine with this sort of tree as well. So here I'm going to run a tree where the outcome is the species and the predictors are petal width and petal length. And I'm going to say the data set is iris. And I can do that and I can make um, the version of the plot that is going to hide some of the extra things that I don't really like to see, like numbers on all the nodes. And here's my tree. Um, you can see that you can't quite see all the um, species names at the bottom until I stretch it out. That's okay. Um, there's various solutions for that, such as I could go into my data set and change the um, species names so that they're shorter, like just abbreviations for these. Or I could work with the plot function to try to um, actually make the, the font size smaller on the labels in the plot. That would work too. Um, what I did just now is I just dragged the window to be a little bit bigger. What we're seeing now is because the outcome variable is categorical, once you get to a final node, so for example, if petal length is less than or equal to 1.9, um, we're right here. Um, we're, we're sure that it's Satosa. What we're seeing is a, is a bar plot at the bottom saying of flowers in the training data set that have petal length less than or equal to 1.9, how many of them were Satosa? How many were Versicolor? How many were Virginica? In this case, they were all Satosa, which says that as far as the training data set is concerned, every time you have a flower with a petal length less than 1.9, it is Satosa. But we're not always that sure. So for example, for flowers that have petal length greater than 1.9, um, but petal width less than 1.9, seven and petal length greater than 4.8 so really big petal lengths um, but small petal widths half of the time those are versicolor half the time they're virginica and so we're less sure of um, our prediction in that case with this categorical variable and I've given you code that'll take away the plots at the bottom as well if you don't like to see the, the graphic. And I think this is harder to read, but now what I have is the three probabilities. So I was focusing on this one just now. Um, if you ended up at this node, there are eight flowers in the training data set like that. And uh, of those eight, zero of them are the first species, 0.5 for the second species, 0.5 for the third species. But of course, now the species aren't labeled. So I don't like this version quite as much. In order to run a random forest, I have to use a different package. I've already installed this package, but I will run the library command. Often people are disappointed um, after running a random forest. Oops, I guess I didn't install it, so I will install that package right now. Often people are disappointed when they run a random forest, and the reason is it sounds like this exciting idea to try lots and lots of trees, but of course if you try a thousand trees, you're not going to make pictures of all of them. And so the output uh, to random forest is kind of kind of interesting. What is it that you'd like to see if you run a thousand trees? And what we're going to see um, is, is that we're going to rank the variables, rank the predictors that went into the tree based on how important they were across all the different trees. So now I've finished um, installing the package. There we go, I've got the um, library command. I'm gonna go ahead and run the random forest command here. You can see it looks very similar. I have sepal length by sepal width and petal length. I'm specifying the data set. I'm saying how many trees I wanna create because remember a random forest involves lots of trees. And I'm telling it that I would indeed like to have the importance output um, be part of what I see. Um, now, 
as I said, there's not a lot you can even see when you're running a random forest, so you may as well um, ask for all the information that's available. Okay, so I did it, um, and I, I called the output RF out, and now I'm going to say RF out dollar sign importance to see um, one particular feature of the output. Now you've seen these dollar signs before um, in a couple contexts, but one in particular, you've seen this when we are looking at particular columns in a data set. So a data frame is a type of R object where the elements of that object are different variables. Uh, and a data frame consists of different variables. But other kinds of R ob objects, for example, the output of random forest, also consists of lots of elements. And one of the elements here is the importances of the different variables. And so if I want to access those, I say RF out dollar sign importance. And what we get here is a list of the predictors, so sepal width and petal length, and then a couple different measures of how important those were. Um, and in this case, both of these measures are more important if they're bigger. So we can see that petal length was a more important predictor of sepal width over all the different versions of the trees that we created.